that's one thing I love about Denmark. I love critical thinking. I love let's get to the point and get it done. What are the mistakes uh, which are okay to mm. make? I have students that come up to me and say like, Ervin, I passed PD3. Don't tell anyone. I still don't speak Danish. Super happy, Ervin. I'm going to try to speak a little bit Danish in the beginning. Hi, El Salmon. Uh, welcome to my YouTube channel. Yahila Kriti. Oh, yeah, I come up for Indian men. Yeah, boy, in Denmark. Oh, yeah, I leave a video on mid live in Denmark. Oh, ide haya Erwin. Oh, this guy's naga. What can do bestow PD3, PD2 exam? Okay. That's yeah. all I can do, Erwin, today. So, but welcome to my YouTube channel, Erwin. I'm so happy to have you and talk to you about the Danish exam, the language exam, PD3, PD2. But to begin with, Erwin, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I know that you are teaching uh, the, the language, but tell us a little bit more ab uh, about yourself. Hi, Kriti. Thanks so much for having me on this video podcast. I'm very excited to be here. Um, uh, so my name is Irvin, and I have been teaching Danish uh, since 2015. I was working as a Danish teacher at uh, Clevis Language School, first in Roskilde and then in Copenhagen. And so I did that for seven years. I think time flew by very fast because I clearly had fun and was really enjoying my work. Uh, I love working with internationals and people from all over the world and introduce them to the Danish language, but also the, the Danish way of living and all of these things that are a bit particular to, to living in Denmark. Um, Clevis closed in Copenhagen uh, last year, and so I decided to uh, uh, go independent. And I, I have my little YouTube channel and Facebook and Instagram. Uh, with the name Learning with Irvin, and uh, it's gone so far really well. I've been uh, teaching Dan Danish as an independent uh, language teacher for now about six months, and it's actually going so well that I decided to teach less, and I have hired a couple of uh, assistant teachers that now are teaching uh, students at all levels, and we try to offer something different than the language schools that are free. When you come to Denmark, you you are usually entitled to up to, I think it's up to five years of five uh, years. Danish lessons and free lessons. But I think you know that as well, Kriti, that um, you have to often like go twice per week and you have homework and often you have a busy life. And often there's, let's say, 10 to 20 students in the free classes. And I, I get a lot of people that contact me that maybe want smaller classes or one-on-one -on -one lessons, uh, online uh, classes that gives people... Uh, a lot of flexibility and so it's it's working very well i think we are, we've become a a good uh, alternative to the existing public language schools and i'm just so grateful it's all working out and i can continue doing what i love helping other people with uh, improving their lives in denmark through uh, learning uh, danish so thanks again for having me here and you are very welcome to ask all the questions you want about it yeah, yeah. So I have a lot of questions because I know that, uh, like my own, my my husband is going to give PD two, and I have two close friends who are giving PD three. So I know the pain because I passed uh, the exam last year. And Arvin, as you were mentioning, you know, even though like we go to the school, what helped me was like one on one sessions, you know, doing with friends or like I remember I had come to your uh, house when you actually hosted, you know, like a Danish meetup and I got to meet a lot of people mm -hmm. and then I met so, with them and practice. So I want oh, to that's know. Great. Yeah. So I want to know from you how important it is like one on one session, especially with a language tutor, like as you mm -hmm. are doing how how important it is so i'd love to give simple and short answers to all of these questions relating to how to learn a language how to do it in the most efficient way but to be honest there are as many learning styles and learning approaches as there are students and teachers and i sometimes tell students uh people learning danish that learning danish is a bit uh, like a box of chocolates uh, because you never really know what you're gonna get you never really know how the chemistry between you and the teacher is going to be you never really are going to know maybe you don't know before starting learning danish whether you learn uh, best by learning a lot of vocabulary by heart 
or maybe you prefer learning some basics of small talking and then just try and get the ball rolling with uh, talking to different people in different situations. So it's very difficult to say this is the one the one best way to do it. I generally say that um, try different things and try and pay attention to what you feel works for you. I think doing the taking the free classes is a wonderful offer and a first step. You get an introduction to, especially if you knew in Denmark, you don't know so many people. I think enrolling in one of the public and free uh, official language schools is a good way to create a, a little network. You'll probably meet a couple of, 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 of friends or people that will become your friends down the, yeah. down the line. And then you get a feel for an in, initial feel for the language, like the basics, like if you enroll in Danish education two or three, it, there's a couple of big modules, so modules one to five and one to six. And the first two modules is kind of beginner modules where you learn to present yourself, say where you what your name is, where you're from and so on. I think those basics are good and you will probably also uh, realize what kind of particular speaking and experience Danish pronunciation is. And uh, all of that are good, good experiences, um, but learning Danish are arriving to Denmark in the beginning is competing uh, with these uh, lovely newcomers uh, with many other things because most likely you have you have a job maybe you came here because of the job you you got or you came here because your partner is Danish or but at the end of the day life in Denmark is busy it's a modern life so everybody's busy friendly but doing their own thing so as uh, many newcomers here, I think they, they realize that learning Danish twice a week is is quite a lot because you have to go, up. you can do online classes, but most of the time people do the physical classes and it's twice per week, two and a half hours each time. You go to the school, you sit down and learn, after, maybe after a long working day. On top of that, you have to prepare the classes, you have to do your homework. So a friend of mine works in Danske Bank as an analyst. Uh, she's from India, by the way. and. Uh, super sweet and i remember that she was doing modules one and two and she had to take a break simply because you know it takes maybe five to ten hours of her work week and when you have a busy full-time job and you have your career and other things to do uh, then 10 hours out of your weekly schedule is a lot so all i'm saying with this long story is basically i think it's good to 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 start and have a little bit of a foundation and then it's yeah. okay to take a break or if you realize oh i need to increase my chances of finding a job then maybe it's good to do an in intensive danish course uh, but it's going to take time to reach the level of danish mastery where you can actually work in danish you know we talk mm -hmm. a lot about PD pd3 which is kind of the most common and but also very difficult danish exam which is a total of five modules and if you go to the language school it's maybe two years two and a half years of going to school every week and so on and you take these module tests at the end of each module and that's a lot of um, effort so if you do that and you make it all the way to the end and you pass this exam pd3 then you reach level b2 on yeah. the so-called european uh, language framework and b2 is very good but it's still not c1 or c2 c2 being absolutely fluent almost native speaking Danish, if you like, you start at module one, which is actually A1 and A2, yeah. and then you go all the way up to what we call B2 on the European framework. But that that that's just to say that even if you pass PD3, I have students that come up to me and say like, Ervin, I passed PD3, don't tell anyone, I still don't speak Danish. Because these module tests and the Danish exam is a lot about, can you write an academic essay? can you speak with difficult words uh, about the say advantages and disadvantages uh, disadvantages of a certain topic so you learn this very kind of artificial academic way of speaking and writing but the kind of everyday grind the everyday speaking in a workplace and so on with danes mumble and speak fast i think that requires even more than pd3 so it's not to disappoint anyone or make it sound harder than it is, but it really depends on what your goals are in terms of learning Danish. Do you just want to learn the basics to have a bit of social Danish going when you meet with Danes and be able to say a few things? Because Danes will, will very quickly switch to English. And that's actually one of the challenges is where can I get to practice um, the Danish I have learned? As many people have to kind of insist 
until they okay. yes we can speak english but actually I, I would love if we can can stick to danish for a bit i think you're the first person who are telling me kriti what like you have to define your goal when it comes to learning the language mm. you know mm. so no like as a comedian now i would like to you know maybe do comedy in danish mm. but mm. i think i didn't define this goal when i was learning and i passed mm. pd3 and now like i'm sometimes i feel i'm back to zero yeah so i think it's yeah, very exactly. important yeah yeah pd3 is not the key to everything uh i think it's an administrative key in the sense that many people also contact me because they've been in denmark for let's say five or six years and they realized they were so busy maybe they did modules one and two and then they had to take a break maybe they got a kid maybe they had more responsibilities but very quickly your life in denmark is just so busy and i have students that stay up late at night to do their homework so i, I fully understand and respect people that take a break i think it's of course good you come to a country you show interest in the culture and the language you learn a bit but i totally respect people that take a break and then life moves on life happens and then five six years down the line they people get to me like i mean you know what um i have a little kid now and my kid is actually speaking better danish to me i'm a little bit embarrassed because of course i went to chit chat with my kid in danish and i go picking up uh, pick my pick up my kid at the kindergarten or uh, daycare institution and i know the the people working there the pedagogues they're like how come your son is speaking so good danish and what about you what happened to you but it's really unfair because you cannot compare a kid learning a new language to an adult's brain like an adult brain is just slow and yeah. we have we are slow we don't absorb like a sponge like a kid so that compar- comparison is really unfair but i totally understand people that then come to me like can you help me uh either for like i want to be able to small talk with my kid in danish but also administratively speaking to apply for permanent residency yeah. uh, because of course you if you're an eu citizen you can stay as long as you want everything is fine but i have lots of people from all over the world india south america uh, pakistan uh, brazil and they have after five may, maybe after three four five years you realize hey despite the rain despite the cold despite the danes despite my poor danish i actually really like this country i actually see myself investing and building a future for myself and my family here like a cassie wonderful person he's on my youtube as well uh it programmer is here with his wife they have a little four-year-old i think daughter uh he's so such a hard-working amazing person and he managed to pass pd3 after he had passed pd2 and i was giving him private lessons and he i don't know how he did it he managed to pass pd3 in four months after having passed you know he passed pd2 last summer and mm-hmm. he just did an intensive course with me and he managed to pull it off and it was so important to him to make sure that he and his family could stay in denmark no matter what permanent residency and their passing pd3 is really one of the administrative boxes you yeah. need to take so saying this thing about pd3 is not necessarily the key to your everyday conversational or work danish um abilities i think that's true because many people they simply need to pass pd3 to get it out of the way administratively yeah. speaking so those are two kind of uh, different things and it's important to know like if you go to pd3 it would not necessarily make you fluent and uh, able to work in uh, in danish in denmark but it will really make your life easier if you're not an eu uh, citizen right yeah we um, have this like if you complete you can go for fast track so four years you have worked mm-hmm. you paid you paid your taxes and you pass your pd3 exam otherwise yeah. it's like eight years and pd2 I so see. if you want to fast track your pr uh, you need mm. to do pd3 and i think that's what people do like pass pd3 and then forget mm. about the yeah the exam I mean I have to blame the system a little bit because in the ideal world you would have Danish classes just as generally focus on maybe making you able to speak on an everyday basis speak 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 situational role plays you're at the bakery what do you say your Danish friend is drunk is mumbling what do you say you're at a house party they're all Danes what do you do you're in a cafe you want to ask if you can offer a tip or whatever but all of yeah. those role plays would be in my opinion after based on my experiences they said would be so useful for so many people but unfortunately everybody's so busy just running after passing the exams to pass the pd3 for administrative purposes in the end of the day as you did you say well i passed it i got it out of the way i could apply for permanent residency and now i'm so busy with my life that i don't use danish and it's kind of like 
a bit of a wasted effort in terms of yeah. like integrating people language wise as well right so um, it's i think that is the system and we have to deal with that and one doesn't exclude the other of course uh, pd3 is of course has a very solid foundation in terms of speaking and some people really pull off um, pd3 and also managing to speak danish on an everyday basis well done to them but far too many kind of fall into that hole as you just described um, yeah. But if I were you, if I was a foreigner from outside of the EU and I come here and the priority or the question is, do you want to learn Danish to be able to small talk in Danish? Do you want to learn Danish to be able to stay in Denmark with your family and make sure that you have 5, 10, yeah. 15 years together here without troubles and you can just stay here? Then, of course, I would go for the latter. Like if, if it's all about like, can we stay in this country or not? Then you just go for PT3 and then integrating and speaking danish on an everyday basis must be a second priority you know what i mean sadly yeah I because everybody speaks really well english here so you don't get yeah. to feel that okay let's go for danish like it's not the first thing it comes yeah. for internationals when you start to think about pr okay i've been so talking uh, about uh, uh, the exam because uh, i think i would like to first focus on the exam which is like in two months mm -hmm. what will be the biggest challenge for people right now mm -hmm. And how can they overcome? Mm -hmm. Like, I think last year when I was giving in two months, this time I was in very uh, like, okay, what is happening and what should I do? So how can people <laughs> overcome the challenges, uh, you know, uh, according yeah. to you? Yeah, I mean, two months is, sh is short, but uh, but there's two months is still uh, enough time to uh, really avoid the, the most common pitfalls uh, when preparing the PD3 exam. First of all, uh, make sure you know what's coming your way. So make sure you know the exam structures for the reading exam, the writing exam, and the speaking exam. So not to advertise too much for my own uh, little uh, school and resources, but on my website, learningwithirvin.com, I sell this PD3 course or PD3 online materials, uh, which is called PD3 Full. And it's more than 30 hours of uh, videos, uh, presentations, best pra practice examples. But there's a big focus on like, make sure you know for example that you have 25 minutes to answer 15 questions for the first reading exam the second part of the reading exam is no less than three different uh, reading exam uh, assignment types make sure you know what to do so there's a lot of strategizing there's a lot of damage control there's a lot of things that you can still manage to understand before uh, the exam in two months um, so of course i recommend that you have a look at my resources um the price is quite steep now uh usually people spend let's say four to six months uh studying my materials we have two months left so i'm of course happy to offer a discount on 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 uh, on my materials because i'd love to help as many people as possible so first of all make sure you you know what's coming your way secondly uh, and again a bit of advertising for for what i offer uh i do we do pd3 coaching uh, group classes i have two very skilled assistant uh, teachers that uh, twice a week uh, take students through uh, three uh, exam papers. So one uh, reading assignment, one writing assignment, and one uh, speaking or exam questions or oral exam questions. And we do that very in a very structured way. So my assistant teachers will then say, okay, um, this week's homework was to prepare this paper, this paper, this paper. And we do it by categories. So I've mapped out the seven main categories of exam topics that come to each exam every year. So I can more or less predict that it's almost 100% sure that you will get one of these seven topics for the PD3 exam. So by covering those seven categories or seven topics, I know that my students will not be taken totally by surprise. The question is, oh, will you have to speak about uh, equality in Denmark, gender? Uh, equality in Denmark, in the workplace, in the reading assignment, in the writing assignment, or in the oral assignment. But most likely, there will be in one of those three uh, exam assignments, there will be something about gender equality. There will be something about, okay, so the seven categories, they are, um, so generally speaking, the welfare system in Denmark, why do we pay a lot of taxes? How is it redistributed? What are the benefits of that? What are the challenges? That's the main one, understanding the welfare system, the Danish model, yeah. if you like. Then it's, of course, focus on uh, the healthcare system. It's great, it's free, but it's not entirely great because there's a lot of uh, waiting time uh, because of the lack of nurses and doctors and so on. So knowing the pros and cons of the Danish healthcare system. The educational system, it's fantastic that it's free and we also pay 
people to study at university, which is also one of the unique things with the Danish model. So we've got welfare, health, education, um, gender equality, then work, uh, work life, work culture, anything related to working in Denmark. Uh, how does it work with labor unions? How do we, um, how, what's our working culture and so on. And there are two more, which are, there's one big one, which is society, like um, it could be crime or CCTV surveillance, pros and cons yeah. about that. So you can tell it's really topics that encourage and invite you to uh, reflect upon difficult topics in Danish. I have people that come up to me like, Irvin, I don't even know what to say about environmental change in my own language. It's so complex. So many people like, Whoa. But that is actually what is expected from you. Now, climate and environment is also one of the seven categories, but I've gone through all the old exam papers and it doesn't come up that often, but it could. And then what's the last one? It's media. Like how much time people spend online? Is it bad or good? Uh, should kids have access to a tablet 24 uh, seven? Should we limit uh, the use of uh, the, the screen time for young people? What are the benefits of uh, being, you know, internet savvy? What are the, what are the kind of risks with that? And then being able to read, to read fast about it, to find the right vocabulary and set the right words and the right paragraphs and right sentences into the reading assignments for the exam. In writing, being able to write a short essay of two to three hundred words in Danish, structuring the pros and cons of, let's say. Uh, kids uh, spending more and more time in front of tablets rather than uh, in the physical world with other kids socializing. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, of course, typical exam questions. In your opinion, what are the pros and cons with kids nowadays growing up literally with a, a, a tablet or a mobile phone, smartphone in their hand? And of course, you have to do that in a fairly correct way. So long story short just to say if you if you follow the coaching and you follow the study calendar i've laid out I, it's basically 20 weeks i think now we're week 10 so there's another 10 weeks before we do the exam and i have about 97 i just checked on my website i have 97 students enrolled in my pd3 material and then i have at least i think we're about 60 or 70 people in my whatsapp group and there's usually let's say between 5 and 15 that 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 take part in the coaching sessions once a week it's at 11 to 11 45 in the morning or during the day so it's difficult for everybody to attend but i record the lessons so you can of course buy yeah. my online material and have access to the recordings but after seven years of teaching danish and preparing people for uh, the pd3 exam i for the first time now as an as an independent teacher i've really laid out a structured approach that i think is really making sure that you cannot be surprised with the topics yeah. you get for PD3. The question is more like, do you have the right amount of vocabulary? And and are you able to, you know, answer the questions in a in, in a fairly correct Danish? You can do that. I think that relates to one of your questions as well. You can, of course, make some mistakes. You can make some typos. You can make a, some small mistakes in, in word order and one, but not too many. Um, yeah. Spelling mistakes, I accept it. it as I to told you, it's about reaching level B2. So to pass PD3, it's fine to mistakes, but a typical mistake, and one of the things that my assistant teachers also keep telling my students is like, answer the assignment and nothing else. Because many students, they come with the mindset that like, oh, um, I just need to show uh, the exam that I can write a lot of sentences in Danish. I've learned all of this. Let me just copy paste from my mind onto this piece of paper, all the Danish sentences I've learned. And, yeah. and you get a paper of like, like three pages and like maybe 1000 words and that's supposed to impress the examiner but actually uh, that's actually will not allow you to pass you will fail the exam you have to do the exact opposite you have to look specifically at what is the writing assi assignment it is very specifically about pay attention to the three points the three bullet points what are they asking about about specifically one question we had in the coaching session yesterday was like in the third the third bullet point for writing the in the writing is it's almost the most difficult it invites you to kind of reflect upon a topic pros and cons and the question was like in your opinion why do you think there's been an increase in danes or people in denmark that do uh, volunteer work uh, and then it had a comma and said with a focus on helping elderly and sick people and so i had many students sending me a paper and be like yeah Irvin, uh, actually it's to my assistant teachers now that correct the papers 
uh, but I also see what what my students write and so on. And many of them in in this case had written a really nice paragraph, well written and everything, about the increase in people volunteering in Denmark about this and that, all kinds of topics. Yeah, your local football club, or you can uh, work in a Red Cross um, shop and so on. But actually, then they misunderstood the question yeah. because the question was, please explain why, in your opinion, do you think there's so many that do volunteer work that decide to focus on helping the elderly and the sick people yeah. in Denmark? And I honestly don't know the question to that. And nobody maybe really knows. We're just learning Danish. So we are not expected to be experts, but you should say something down the lines, that, uh, something like, um, there can be many reasons why there has been an increase in volunteers that work to help mm -hmm. elderly and sick people. One of the reason, one of the main reasons, in my opinion, could be that Denmark has an aging population and there are more and more people that live a long life, but that need elderly care. Uh, and then you come with a concrete example and then you try and develop that as an essay. But you stick to the question and everything else that you've learned and spent so much time and energy on, that you can just put aside because it's unfortunately a very, very, very unfair uh, language assessment because you can be good in many topics and if you get a difficult topic you haven't really prepared, you might fail the exam. So uh, that's quite merciless. But that's one of the things that we really try to, to make people understand the structure what's coming your way, what to do, what not to do. Um, so do the coaching classes if you can, uh, buy my yeah. online material if you can. And you can, of course, book a private session. So I have to say, booking a private class with me is now 700 kroner for 45 minutes. So I kind of did it on purpose because I, I cannot teach so much anymore. It's like yeah. I, I almost, I didn't have a burnout, but I taught so much the last exam round and I was really proud that so many people wanted uh, help from me. But I realized, realized in my mind, when you have a little business growing, you need to delegate a bit. And then that's why I'm yeah. so grateful I have. And half uh, of my team is like people from abroad who have come to Denmark and done the five, six years that you have done as well in Denmark, going through all of the traditional classes, all the challenges with making a, a having a work-life balance and learning Danish on top, and then passing PD3, all that struggle and so on. And some of them actually did really well. And I've, so I have uh, Nazia from Bangladesh. She's helping me teaching students, preparing modules, typically one, two, and three. Um, yeah. I have Klaus, who is Danish, native Dane. Uh, and I had to coach him in the whole PD3 thing, but he's doing PD3 coaching sessions on Tuesdays. I have Damien. He is half Spanish, half uh, Danish. And he did PD3 and he scored high grades. He's really good at writing. So I have coached him. So he's helping students on Thursdays. Who else yeah. do I have on my team? I have Ni from Vietnam, who's super good at correcting exam papers. She got 12 for PD3 writing. So she's like really good at just like pinpointing students. And But I'm very uh, happy to uh, uh, know that you have all the non-native uh, speakers yeah. in your team. Because, yeah. because they understand the hardship and the struggles yeah. that new students are going through. And that empathy and understanding uh, is actually something that some Danish teachers don't have simply because they yeah. didn't go through it themselves. So for in me, it's very important that the teacher understands the student's situation and can be in their shoes and be like, hey, I did these mistakes. You shouldn't do the same thing. Make sure you do this and that. And that's why it's so valuable to have these uh, uh, former students in my in my team. And they're doing a great job. Yeah. Uh, Damien uh, is, is really good at Danish. He has a bit of a Spanish accent, but I welcome that. I encourage that yeah. because at a wider, at a higher level, also at university, because I also did the, the mandatory Danish teacher training on top of my existing master's degree. They were very much about like, well, what is Danish culture and what is Danish language? And one of the conclusions was like, there's not one Danish culture. There are yeah. many uh, Danish culture, cultures in Denmark intertwined, running separate lives. You've got uh, work and living in the countryside. You've got living in Aarhus. You've got living in Copenhagen. You've got living in the suburbs. You've got Career. So there are many types of, there's a working class, Danish, there's maybe a highbrow yeah. Danish, and you know what I'm saying. So the entry, the, the perspectives on what is Danish culture and what is the right way of speaking Danish should be uh, multi multidisciplinary. Yeah. It should be in plural. And that's why I think it's amazing Damien is uh, with us on the team because he has the Spanish culture knowledge and the Danish one. He knows the challenges with Danish pronunciation from a Spanish speaker's perspective. Um, and Ni from Vietnam, she really knows the struggles as well with Danish uh, pronunciation. And she has just 
really become a master at Danish grammar. She's better than me in terms yeah. of like uh, correcting uh, essays. So I, I really welcome everybody's talents in this process. And um, I'm proud of it. I'm really proud to have a team that's so multicultural. It's yeah. fantastic. So uh, talking about like, as you're saying, like, you know, like uh, somebody has like a Danish, uh, speaking Danish, but has like a Spanish uh, touch to it. Uh, and yep. I think with speaking, uh, if you talk about the speaking exam, like I had my teacher, but there was one more examiner. And I remembered I was speaking and she was just writing, writing and writing what I was speaking. Yeah, yeah. So mm. I want to know when the speaking, because you have like just 10 minutes where it goes mm -hmm. like this. What are the mistakes uh, which are okay to mm. make? And what are the mistakes Great. which which are just a no-no? Uh, when you are entering yeah. that room for 10 minutes. The first thing that comes to my mind, a no-no is speaking English. A no-no is using an English word thing like, hee hee hee, yeah. eh, labor market, you know what I mean. <laughs> that doesn't go. <laughs> you yeah. got to stick to Danish. And if you, it always happens, you're, 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 you're nervous. And, and it's very human to be nervous, by the way. I tell my all students, like, listen, you can always say I'm a little bit nervous before the exam starts. Put your hands together if you're shaking breathe do some exam simulations before you attend the exam and as you say it goes by so fast the oral exam is like 10 minutes five minutes of your presentation follow-up questions and five minutes on a topic you haven't prepared with follow-up questions and then that's it and it's really unfair because maybe you were just you had a bad night's sleep and you were nervous and you were completely but so one thing you should avoid is like if you can't remember the word in days to switch to english or to say it in english just try and say what you wanted to say a different way and it means that most examinators, the one asking the questions, usually your teacher, but you can also sign up for the exam as a private student so you don't know who you will get. But your teacher is there to help you. I had took I had two online classes last year that I took through PD3, and I think two classes of 20 students all passed except one or two for personal reasons. Uh, they had some other things happening at the same time. But so, of course, I was very proud, but we did so much exam training, exam simulation, and going through the old exam papers and, and working on what you do if you get stuck. Well, you just try and say it a different way. You come up with a similar word that is not exactly what you want to say, but more or less. And I, as a teacher, asking them questions for the exam, of course, I know their levels. I know more or less. Uh, there are some obligatory questions that you have to ask, but there's also mm -hmm. uh, some, some, there's some space for me to also ask a follow-up question that is um, more personalized or like, the idea is that you have a reflected, constructive discussion about a topic together. And there's a ping pong in danger. So obviously, if you go totally, have a total blackout or you're like, oh, and you don't know to say anything, then of course the assessment will be very poor. But um, I mean, if the teacher does his or her job good and covers the seven uh, categories and train, then it's totally normal to be nervous and it should be good and it should be possible to pass if you're pre yeah. well prepared. Now you can pass just with the grade 0 02 or 0 02. And yeah. then the scale goes from minus three to uh, 0 0 and then 0 02, 0 02. And, mine, and then up to 12. But minus three and 0 0 is unfortunately failed or not passed. And you need a two to pass. And it doesn't require that much, but you have to have your vocabulary and be able to have a conversation in Danish about two difficult topics, right? Uh, but if you do that, you'll pass and avoid speaking English. But then the next level is some people need to have a 7 or a 10. Actually, for those who are doctors and nurses yeah. from abroad, it might change, actually. The legislation might change. But currently, if you come from outside of the EU and you're a trained doctor or nurse, you need 7 in the reading, 7 in the writing, and 10 in the oral. So the scale goes from minus 3 to 0 to 0 to 4, 7, 10, and then 12 for the very remarkable, good top performance um, in the exam goes for yeah. writing and reading and speaking but a big no-no would of course be to switch to english or say english words that doesn't work and mm -hmm. another one would be uh, to misunderstand the question so you only get four questions for the oral exam in the second part first you present you get questions about what you presented but in the second part you get a topic you haven't prepared and then you have you get four questions and once those four questions have been asked then the exam is over and so it's always important that you make sure you understand the question because you think you understand the question, you misunderstood the question, and then you start speaking for one or two minutes and you're like, rah, rah, rah. and then the examiner is like, yes, but actually I didn't mean uh, volunteers in general in Denmark. Yeah. I meant volu people doing volunteering, uh, helping specifically elderly and sick people. 
And then you kind of miss the opportunity to answer that question. And they can only draw you down, right? Yeah. Because the, the, it has to be said that the, your total grade is uh, based on four fourths, four quarters. So the reading exam is one quarter, one fourth of your grade. The writing exam is one fourth of your grade and double is two fourths. Yeah. So the oral exam counts double. And people are like, why is that? And it's because obviously when you get a question from the examiner, you have to listen and understand. So the oral exam is a combined listening exercise yeah. and of course a speaking assessment. Mm -hmm. So that's why it comes double. So make sure you understand the examiner's question. And if not, you say, I'm sorry, could, could you please repeat that? If you say that once, it's not going to draw you down. But if you say, um, I'm mm -hmm. not sure I understood your question. Can you, and all of this in, is in Danish, of course, right? I'm not sure I understood your question. Can you say it in a different way? Of course, that will pull you down a little bit. I had, I, so you, also, also as a teacher, you learn. And one advice to get, I gave to a student last year, and I regret it so much, is I said, if you're not sure about the question, make sure you ask, you re ask the examiner to repeat the question so you avoid this specific pitfall. And she took that advice so literally that she did exactly that for all four questions. So you oh. get the question, she'd be like, excuse me can you repeat the question and so she did that literally and she didn't get the got the grade she needed she didn't get a 10 she got a 7 because yeah. examinator and center they both got uh, an impression that there was not this kind of mm, easy flowing constructive ping pong in danish between the examinator yeah. and and the student and she was crying on the phone because i'm here to help everybody so i was like disappointed with myself because i kept saying that and then she took it so literally and then she applied that advice to every single question so of course you shouldn't do that yeah um so i learned a lot from that you spoke about two people in the exam situation besides the student so you you are you you the student you're you're in the room and the other side of the, the table is the examiner who is usually your teacher if you go to a language school uh, at module five module five is the preparatory module for uh, for pd3 and then on the side as you said there's another person who is yeah. uh, always called in or invited from another language school and so we rotate i haven't done it myself i've only been testing the students at, at the Clevis language school but usually people are, when they are certified testers they are sent out as sensors and that person you were mentioning earlier about just sitting and scribbling yeah. that's exactly what the sensor is supposed to do it doesn't mean you made a lot of mistakes it just means that uh, to make sure that the assessment is as precise as possible yeah. uh, sensor is there to have like uh, this is an outside view on the ping pong and as an examiner you don't have time to both listen ask questions reflect on the next question and take yeah. notes at the same time so that's what sensor does and then when the exam ends after 10 minutes the oral exam we ask the student to leave the room for a brief uh, for a couple of minutes and then sensor and the examiner will have a what should we say a discussion a very, or something. i was i was, was going to say a scientific discussion but it's really like okay uh, clearly, the student has uh, is well prepared and has good pronunciation in the presentation, but didn't understand fully all four follow up questions for his or her presentation. So yeah, that was something. Uh, did you notice also there were some issues with word order in this part? And so every sensor is taking notes of all of this. So there's really a professional dialogue between yeah. sensor and examiner for a couple of minutes, which is to ensure that the assessment and the grade giving is as professional and professionally assessed as possible. Another thing about all of the scribbling down, writing down by the sensor is there are unfortunately moments where a student is extremely satisfied with his or her performance, but sensor and examiner, examiner are like, well, yeah, there was a great flow of speaking, lots of correct sentences in Danish, but the student didn't understand, didn't misunderstood every single question we asked. So there was a total misunderstanding in the questions and unfortunately wow. we cannot let this person pass that would be a a zero instead of a zero two or maybe a small zero to oh two simply because that there was a total lack of comprehensive communication that so you would have make a sense proof, to both parties yeah. so yeah long story yeah. shorty there there are students that are disappointed with their grade and some will be like crying and sad and i remember i went to school many years ago in high school and got a bad grade and I was crying because I put a lot of effort into 
what I did and I was so disappointed. But when looking back, it's true that I got a topic that I wasn't so well prepared for. And why I was sad was because I felt that the grade was not at all representing or representative of my actual uh, knowledge level in that uh, it was political science in, in high school uh, grade. That's 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 yeah. that's how why life is a, a like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. You can yeah. it's like you never know what teacher you're going to get. You never know what neighbor you're going to get. So that's what I tell students. Try it. See if it works for you or not. So back to your question about the scribbling. And so if a, st a student is very, very, very unhappy, it, it happens that a student will complain to the school about this specific incident or whatever. And then the teacher, extensor and examiner have to be able to say, well, we gave the student this grade because of this, this and that. It's not a very comfortable situation for this, the teacher and the censor in the school because of, of course we're trying to do our job as professional as possible. Yeah. Of course, like everything in life, mistakes do happen. But I have to say, I have attended both the, the teacher trainings uh, for the actual PD3 exam, how to do the assessments, and also taken the year and a half additional edu uh, university degree to teach Danish at this level. And uh, so I would say all of the elements are put in place to deliver a professional assessment uh, for the all exam. Yeah. So. That, that that's the scribbling so it doesn't mean that you did anything wrong or you did a lot of mistakes no no it was sure. like it was she was writing i'm like okay what is she uh, maybe she was writing like what i was telling but i was happy with my grade so i was like i didn't go for like i need to uh yeah but i, I mean, like as you're mentioning about you know like you have a lot of resources online that people mm -hmm. can you know uh, look and then also uh, mm -hmm. you know buy uh but what what else mm -hmm. would you recommend uh, uh maybe uh, like um uh, are there like people should start watching uh, movies, uh, should read books and stuff when you're learning the language? So there are different categories of students. As we spoke about earlier, there are students who are like, uh, Urban, I just need to pass PD3 so yeah. I can apply for PR. Huh? There are like the Iranian doctor who is like super qualified, super skilled, who's just like not allowed to work before he or she passes PD3 and then does the medical exam to get authorized and then can start working. And that's like, a, that can be a two year process and they're, they're just so smart and so motivated and so hardworking. And you can just tell they're, they are absorbing everything they can. They will go through old exam papers, which are pretty much available everywhere in different forums and so on. And so you can, you can, you can eat, eat your way through all of the old exam reading uh, exam assignments. You can do all of the writing, written papers. You can practice all the questions so that is of course an advice i give to everybody but those who want the really good grades they will do a, a language path where they also like they will they will look at um series uh, on dr free documentaries yeah. free series and they will watch them with danish subtitles maybe they will start with english subtitles but really immersing them taking notes and so on so all of all of that everything helps but to be very honest with you i would say a, a big part of my students a big amount of my students, they just need to pass or have decent grades, and they do, they would like to do what you just talked about: listen to podcasts, watch TV, and so on. But normal Danish podcasts and normal TV shows, they are high level, and yeah. even preparing for PD three, it's tough. A lot of students they will watch uh, Borgen or Bowen or Rita or all of those classics on Netflix. And my advice is like, do it, do it, do it. But if you're asking me, Irvin, do you think there's a clear link between that language immersion, watching Netflix series in Danish and TV series and podcasts? Oh, I put the I put on the Danish radio ten minutes every morning when I get up. Does that really have a big impact on your PD three performance? I don't think so. To be very honest, yeah. and if you're short on time, and if you need to ensure damage control in terms of like what to do, what not to do, stick to the old exam papers. Uh, make sure you know the exam structures, work with my materials, contact me if you need a discount, work with my assistant teachers, do the coaching, do a private session. I have a lot of students that are doing one 45 minute, five, 45 minute session with one of my assistant teachers. As I said earlier, I charge 700 kroner. That's way too much for many people. But it's because now I manage the team. So I, it, it, time is money also. So, but my yeah. assistant teachers, they charge 300 kroner. And then think that's very fair for a very hands-on skilled expert coaching in terms of the PD3 exam. This is what you got to do. This is what you got to do, including, you know, giving you feedback on your homework and stuff. So I think 300 kroner for a 45 minute session, I think that most people can do. Yeah. I know it's still money. 
Um, so I, that's what I recommend. Do uh, one private session a week, 45 minutes, yeah. and then attend this PD3 coaching group session. That's a uh, that's actually only 50 kroner per session if you have bought my materials, and if not, it's yeah. I think 75 kroner per session. And usually, you have to pay four sessions that go. So yeah, it's 300 kroner per month to attend the coaching sessions if you can. And you can do it once, twice a week. You can be in both Klaus's session on Tuesdays at 11. You can be in Damon's session Thursdays at 11. Do both. So lots of ways to like really strategically in a very like very focused way uh, prepare what's coming away in terms of PD3. If yeah, you so have we, the time, yeah. if you're aiming for high grades, if if you have that low luxuries, yes, of course, immerse yourself in podcasts and, and sh TV shows and films and what have you not. But for PD3, make sure you know what's coming your way specifically, right? Yeah. So like now, if you have like if we talk about only PD3, like now just two months or PD2 also. So as you mentioned, like know the structure, have some resources, yeah, 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 yeah. get yeah. on. Uh, if you're struggling with, you know, speaking, then have those one on one sessions. A hundred percent. And even contact me. Or, yeah, yeah. I mean, the best advice now, if you're like panicking right now, you enroll. I, as we speak, I got a message from a, I think she's a doctor and she's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm enrolled at OPD3. It's in two months. Uh, I'm panicking a bit. I'm a doctor. I really need some symptoms. What can you do to help me? And what, what I will do after this podcast, I will write to her and say, listen, uh, this is my schedule, my calendar, Just choose any day and time that's available. And we sit down on Zoom uh, for yeah. 30 minutes, uh, me and uh, the student and one of my assistant teachers, be Klaus or Nazia or Damien. And the three of us, we just, it's a free session, 30 minutes. Okay, what's your goal? What's your situation? Any particular things that you're very afraid of? Uh, what are your strengths? And then we just put a plan and the plan is basically, okay, uh, you're going to do one private class with Klaus or Damien once a week, this time, bam, and you agree on the first day and time, you pay the 300 kroner via my mobile pay. I have this learning with urban company mobile pay, it works perfectly fine. And they do the first class and if the student is satisfied, then it's just every week between now and PD3, make yeah. sure that you get feedback on your writing and so on. That's actually one of the pitfalls, thinking that you can just do the, ex the exam papers without getting yeah. feedback. I tell students writing a good PD3 essay requires that you do it over and over and over based on your feedback. So do the paper once a week, get the feedback from one of, student, of my uh, assistant teachers from me, or I didn't mention, uh, what's her name? Uh, Otilia, she's from Romania. She's a doctor. She she loves uh, helping other people. She's been through the whole PD3 system. She charges we charge 125 kroner. So if you if you have very little money and you need to do one thing, then make sure you know how to write a paper and get feedback. So they do that once a week, and you you get detailed grammatical corrections of your paper. You get an estimate of what grade you would get, and you get also ref, uh, references to and links to what you where you can learn more about how to improve. The gram uh, to correct the grammatical mistakes and of course you get how the wording should be and alternatives how you could write the paper better that's super i think that's super helpful extremely detailed and pedagogical help for the student so that's do you do so you, you need think, feedback yeah. so yeah, yeah I, I think i realized like be becoming better at writing a good pd3 exam paper is like uh, becoming a sculpture you write stuff and then you cut you cut you cut you cut yeah. you you add it's like it's like you know you're sculpting the paper and i never thought about this in terms of being a dane and native speaker and i'll just i'll just write stuff but this is such a specific academic rigorous assignment that's so specific to the danish system that people coming from abroad i have students from india and iran they will typically say Irvin, just tell me what i need to learn by heart and they will just like yeah. digest everything and they just think they can spit it all out like blah, 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 blah. and then the the, in the danish exam the examiner and said they're like well, well we we can tell you know a lot and you've learned a lot by heart but this is not at all what we want this, to know yeah. it's danish learning and teaching system is all about critical thinking can you understand what I'm saying? What's your what's your take on what I'm saying? What are the general causes? What is, in your opinion, reason for this is happening? All in all, why do you think this is like it is? Any suggestions to how we could improve it? So the Danish uh, educational system is all about critical thinking and group work. And I'm half French myself, so I did the French school actually in Copenhagen, and it was a lot of learning by heart, very academic. We had to read books, write summary books, but the Danish approachable like eh, 
listen to each other, work together, be critical, be respectful. Like in France, if you, I remember when I went to the French school, I would ask a question to the teacher and I, I didn't say vous, I said tu, uh, which it's a pol polite marker. And he yelled at me and got so angry. And yeah. I later I got praised for asking critical questions, but I had to learn to ask them in a polite way in the French system. And then I was kind of appreciated. But yeah, I keep speaking, but it's just to say uh, that you need to know what is expected uh, from from PD3 to do it in the. But you summarize it so well. Uh, uh, in that uh, Dan learning language, like Danish language, is about critical thinking and group work. So I think people should focus even when they are starting. You know, like uh, as a as a new person moving to Denmark, get onto mm -hmm. that. And what I understood, like you know, it's also about knowing like the Danish culture how things work here in Denmark, because those mm -hmm. are the questions and the topics which will come when you're giving the exam. The yeah. two things, the two worlds are very much interlinked. The learning Danish or Danish educational system, that world is very much in, uh, linked with the way we work in Denmark. So mm -hmm. in France, you're expected to, in many workplaces, stay at, at late and work hard, and you would never leave the office before your boss leaves the office and stuff like that. A lot of etiquette, a lot of hierarchy. In Denmark, your boss doesn't necessarily know more than you, but he happens to be good at taking good decisions based on the input you give to him or her. So a good a good team member in a Danish workplace is a, is a team member who respectfully uh, shares his opinion and experience on a matter to the group and to the, to the leader or the boss so that the boss together with the team can make informed good decisions, yes. sound decisions. Whereas in France, the leader typically is supposed to be this alpha person who knows everything. It's like this omniscient person. Uh, and that's very much interesting how Danish working culture is very much different. Like we are very much like give each other feedback, speak together, uh, let information flow across hierarchies so we can get to the point and get things done in the most fast and efficient way possible. Possible because a good Danish workplace and a good Danish work boss will be like, oh, You've reached your targets. You've uh, found the solutions to think. Why don't you go home at 2 p.m. today? Take a rest. I know you yeah. really, really, you know, thought thoroughly about that. And you mm, took some s smart decisions here and we got this thing solved. Why don't you leave at 3 p.m. today? Go have a good time. Enjoy your uh, spending time with your kids. So this work-life balance with, combined with being focused on very result-oriented. That's one thing I love about Denmark. I love critical thinking. I love, let's get to the point and get it done. It's just that it can be in a very direct way. So speaking yeah. about Danes and being Danish, my mom, who's French, she always thinks Danes are a little bit rude. They will enter a shop. They will not even say hello. My mom, she's like, put you off. Stuff like that. Like, but she has been in Denmark for 40 years and she sees the, the pros and cons and the benefits and no country is perfect. Yeah. But one thing that I agree with my mom is that I think Danish working culture is very much straightforward and to the point that get things done. Not so much, oh, la, la, did I wear the right shirt today? Or did I say the right polite marker? I think in India, you also have a lot of polite markers between yeah, yeah. elderly and so on. So just long story short again to say, learning the language, uh, learning to work in Denmark and, uh, and, and learning to live with Danes are all intertwined. And through my classes, it's something that I will bring up because I think yeah. once you understand kind of those three dimension in a more holistic way, then you can, you get less offended. You understand things better. Maybe one day you will also manage to decipher Danish humor, which is like super dry yeah. and ironic. Uh, for, at the end of this podcast, I might tell you, oh, this was a shitty podcast, huh? But I will mean, of course, this was like, that was so awesome, right? I got to know so much, you know, like I never, I I, I passed PD3, but I've never got to understand the language. I think I did uh, mm -hmm. it today. But I'm going to put all the, uh, like your material, like where can people connect with you? Because sure. we only have two, uh, like two months to go for the exam. So I hope you will give some discounts if people are coming from my uh, channel. I want to stress this. I want to stress this. I want to help everybody. Money should never be an issue. I will yeah. give everybody some help of some kind. Yeah. It shouldn't be an issue. Contact me, write to me. I'll be happy to help. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Win, for today. And uh, everybody, uh, all the best for the exam. And there's a life outside of passing PD3. It's yes. not because